Hello again, and welcome back. Thank you for tuning in this week. There's been tons of things going on in the housing market in the last week or two. We're going to get into the new Canadian housing plan that's just been announced, and it's going to be in the budget today. They're going to go into more detail, but we do have most of the summary of it so far. I'm going to get into the Korea national statistics briefly, and of course, I'm going to touch on that 2017 pricing that you saw in the thumbnail. Let's start off with the Korea national statistics that was released for the month of March. So the main headline here is hints of active spring market in March housing data. So that's just hints of something. Um, looks like they're really digging here to, to try to find something, but let's hear what they say in the first paragraph. While there are expectations the Canadian housing market will pick up on some level this year, home sales and prices were mostly unchanged on a month over month basis in March, 2024 according to the latest data from the Canadian Real Estate Association. So sales and prices are flat by the sounds of it. Let's take a quick look at the data they provide, and I'll get into my own data right after. Residential sales activity, you can see there for Q1 2024, pretty subdued, nothing special. The new listings, new listings are looking healthy for Q1 2024. Uh, not the highest they've ever been, but they are in that healthy range uh, for new listings, which is uh, very promising. Here's the residential market balance, the months of inventory there in the blue bars, sitting at 3.8 months, the same as February. We'll see where it goes from here. And the red line is the sales to new listings ratio. It's just over 57%. So in a balanced territory. And it uh, doesn't look like it's making any major moves anytime soon, but will be interesting to see where that goes in the coming months. Now looking at the national average residential price. This is for March. The actual price was $698,000. So remember that as we go through the rest of this video because it's important, which was up 1.9% month over month from February or $13,000. It was up 1.7% year over year from last March or $12,000. And we are down 14.5% from the peak, the 2022 peak, which was $816,000. So we're down 118,000 since then. Now let's get into that 2017 price forecast. And uh, it might be hard to believe for some, but let's just take a look at where prices were in 2017. So here is the, again, the national chart uh, for average prices. And you can see in the red circle, that was 2017. And they did go from, uh, you know, the lows to the highs. So we had a big spike in 2017 to begin with. So again, not that far off, but let's take a look at the data here to see how how I came up with this prediction or forecast. Now, many people say, well, you can't use stock indicators on real estate charts, but uh, that's like saying, well, the real estate market hasn't been treated like the stock market or like an investment portfolio when it actually has been. So I say you can because we're seeing very similar patterns. So we're starting with the bearish pennant pattern. And of course, the bearish pennant, it's a continuation pattern. And we're going from a high spot down to a low. And uh, the target there is calculated from the previous move down. And of course, the continuation of that move, that would bring us to around $485,000. And again, this is the national average price. We're at six ninety eight dollars now. So that's, uh, yeah, $200,000. That's a lot of money. But again, we see $100,000 price swings yearly now just due to seasons. So it's really not that out of range. Next, moving on to the mean line. Of course, mean reversion is a big thing that people talk about or a big uh, trend that people talk about. And the theory would be that, you know, things always revert to the mean. And they don't just revert to the mean. It's not a support line. It's actually a mean line. So it goes past the mean and it comes back up. So it always doesn't just hit it and bounce off of it is what I guess what I'm saying. So based on that trajectory, it probably will dip below the mean. Given that, we would probably be at the top of the 2017 pricing, which would be 560000 for the national average price point. Now, again, you may think this seems far-fetched and I'm clutching at straws, but it's not. This is a very realistic scenario. If you look at that last dip there in January 2023, it got down, the average, national average price got down to $612,000. The peak in 2017 was $560,000. 
that's only a $60,000 difference. Again, we do that in a month or two. Actually, we've done that in less than a month in Ontario lately. So don't be surprised. It's not far off at all. And it's very possible and very likely, actually. So now if you have watched my channel in the past, you know that I've used the Fibonacci tool or the Fibonacci retracement levels in the past. Here I've started the move. The start of the move was back in 2020 once the major lockdowns ended in the initially. So about May or so when the market started to take off. And of course, the top is at the peak in 2022. So we hit a major level on the way down, uh, which was that 61.8%, which is, again, this is a major level on the Fibonacci. And right above that, you'll see support uh, around the 50%. Now, if we retrace back to the next major level, which is the 78.6 level, which, again, very likely, that brings us to the top of 2017, which is about $555,000. So, so far, we're from 485 to 560, depending on the chart pattern we're going to use or we're going to select. But again, we're in that range, and those are all 2017 price points. The last one, this comes from the government's own mouths, and this is about the 30% of your income. So the government in their new housing plan, which we're going to get into right after this, says at the heart of this plan lies a commitment to make housing affordable. No hardworking Canadian should have to spend more than 30% of their income on shelter costs. And I agree. And that's kind of the, the benchmark everywhere. This is not a new concept. This is the way it's always been. So how do we get to this level to have healthy, a healthy society and a healthy workforce? Well, let's look at it. So I'm putting the average household income around $100,000. I've seen reports from 92 to 100 and something, but we'll call it 100,000, especially in a year or two from now, because it's going to take time to get to this 30%. I don't think we're going to do it in a year or two, but anyway, uh, let's just give the benefit of the doubt to the numbers here. So 30% of that $100,000 income, and again, this is gross income pre-tax. The government's not going to use your after-tax income and base that 30% off of that. No, this is pre-tax. Just like when you're qualifying for a mortgage, they don't take your after-tax, they take your pre-tax income. That's a whole other story. So $30,000 per year would be 30% of your average household income in Canada or $2,500 a month. Now, this is shelter costs. You can see there, this is very clear. This is not just mortgage costs or rental costs. This is shelter costs, which some could argue could include water and electricity. But again, for mortgage pre-approvals and financing uh, sakes, they only use heat a lot of the time. So I'm going to use heat and property tax, obviously. So $2,500 minus your $300 property tax minus $125 per month in heat. You're down to just over $2,000 or $2,075 a month for that shelter cost or for the remaining mortgage part of the shelter cost. Now, using my trusty mortgage calculator, that would get you a mortgage of about $420,000. Now, this is based off a $525,000 purchase price with $105,000 down or 20% down. But anyway, it is $420,000. And I put this at a lower rate because, of course, we're expecting rates to come down at some point. So I put this at a 3.5% fixed mortgage rate with a 25-year amortization because, no, this is not a new house. We're talking about all resale homes here. So 25-year amortization. So that puts the price of the home for this average 30% shelter cost payment around $525,000 if you are purchasing a home. Again, in that 2017 range from 485 to 560. So not at all out of the realm. This is the target from the government. And uh, again, all the indicators and the patterns would support uh, a movement like this, right? Hard to believe, but very possible, especially when we have those $100,000 seasonal swings we see in Canada recently. So moving on to this Canada housing plan, solving the housing crisis, and this is what they're planning to do. There's a lot of talk about this. It's all tied into the budget, but of course, there's a lot of politics in it too. So I want to dissect uh, the important parts of this. I'm going to focus on the two sections. So there's three sections on it. So we have the first two sections. Building more homes by bringing down the cost of home building, helping cities make it easier to build homes at a faster pace, changing the way Canadian home builders manufacture homes, and growing workforce to ensure we get their job done. 
Second section, making it easier to rent or own a home by ensuring that every renter or homeowner has a home that suits their needs and the stability to retain it. So before I go on, there are lots of things in this uh, plan that deal with rental units and affordable housing, low-income housing, and all the rest of that. No, I'm not saying we don't need those. We do need those as part of a healthy plan. But again, I'm focusing on the home ownership part and how it affects homeowners and first-time buyers and whatnot. So one of the big things they've been preaching is changing the way industry builds homes. We need to invest in ideas and technologies like prefabricated housing factories, mass timber production, penalization, 3D printing, and pre-approved home design catalogs. So in that first section, this was all there really was about the home ownership plan was everything else was about creating rental units and apartment buildings. But this was kind of the way they're going to tackle it. And it was down near the bottom. So it wasn't at the top. The top was all rental units, creating apartment buildings and all these subsidies and, and whatnot and tax incentives for builders. So again, I, I'm not really impressed that I don't think their focus is on uh, middle class home ownership. I think it's still in that socialist kind of agenda where everyone's going to be renting apartments. Uh, but anyway, let's move on to the next section because that's it for section one, uh, pretty much just changing the way we build homes. So section two, the theme is making it easier to rent or own a home. Getting into your first home, extending mortgage amortizations for first time buyers buying newly built homes. Allow 30-year mortgage amortization for first-time home buyers purchasing new builds. So the plan is to take on more debt over longer periods of time. Not a great solution in my opinion, and it's only for new homes, mind you. But that's not going to make it more affordable. It's just going to create more debt. Uh, but anyway, let's move on and see what else we can find here. Strengthening the Canadian Mortgage Charter mortgage relief they can seek and receive from their financial institutions, including making permanent mortgage relief measures available where appropriate. So this is the extend and pretend program where banks have extended amortizations, uh, you know, from they talked about 35 years in a news conference or a press conference last year, but it was actually, you know, these things have been extended for like 95 years. So with the Canadian Mortgage Charter, they want to allow the banks to make these permanent so that you're just paying interest for the rest of your life, I guess, uh, these 95-year mortgages, as long as you can't really afford a real payment. So there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of interest here. There's a lot of debt over long periods of time. Not really a great solution. So again, as I just said, it's extend and pretend more debt and more payments for longer periods of time. This is nothing new. Leveraging the tax-free first home savings account where you can put up to $40,000 for your first house in a TFSA. And of course, that's tax-free. So nothing new there. Increasing the home buyer's plan withdrawal limit. Budget 2024 will propose the government's intention to increase the home buyer's plan limit from $35,000 to $60,000, extending the grace period to repay the home buyer's plan withdrawals by an additional three years. So, of course, this is the RRSP plan where you can borrow from your RRSPs from your retirement. This money is supposed to be for your retirement. And put it down on your first house. Now it was 35. Now it's going up to $60,000 and they're adding three more years to the time, uh, the amount of time you have to pay it back. So of course, when you take that money, you have to pay it back. And I think it was over 15 years or something. So of course, more debt, less retirement savings and more time to pay it back. So again, another extend and pretend uh, kind of solution here. Combating mortgage fraud. Criminal organizations, as well as individuals, are seeking to take advantage of the housing crisis by perpetrating high-value mortgage frauds, victimizing homeowners and new home buyers by artificially inflating demand, which can increase home prices. Budget 2024 will propose the government's intention to consult with the mortgage industry on making a tool available through the Canada Revenue Agency to verify borrower income from mortgages. So, of course, this is people faking T4s or Brampton mortgages, Vaughn mortgages. I've heard all these different names for them where you're counterfeiting your income or making up your income with fake slips to 
of course, pump the housing market and buy speculative purchases. And, and this is a big problem and this needs to be combated. Now here we have, the, they're gonna consult. I don't really see a timeline in here, but I'd like to see a timeline. I'd like to see something happening because of course, mortgage fraud and income fraud is a huge part of why these people and speculators can close these deals and can purchase these homes. And they've made tons of money doing this. So yeah, very important. I'd like to see something done, but uh, we'll see if it happens. They're talking about it, but we'll see what happens. Cracking down on real estate fraud. The government is committed to reinforcing the fairness of the tax system and combating tax non-compliance across the housing sector. Budget 2024 will propose funding for the CRA to continue addressing tax non-compliance in real estate. Tons of tax and mortgage fraud, just more measures that uh, Canada is going to try to do to... I guess, stop people from committing these these tax frauds. So CRA is going to be doing lots of investigations. Hopefully it doesn't end up that innocent people are getting penalized during these investigations, but and they actually catch the right people or penalize the right people uh, that are doing these, these frauds. And last on their list, which is probably the most important in my opinion, you've heard me talk about this many times on this channel, confronting the financialization of housing. Housing should be treated as homes for people instead of a commodity for big investment portfolios. When purchasing a home, Canadians expect to be bidding against other potential buyers, not a multi-billion dollar hedge fund. Budget 2024 will propose that we intend to restrict the purchase and acquisition of existing single-family homes by very large corporate investors. This is like a U.S. problem. I don't, I haven't seen or I haven't heard of big corporate investors purchasing single family homes. I've heard of small investors and speculators doing it and they create a corporation to do it in, but these are not billion dollar hedge funds. Now, I think maybe we've heard about the threat of them wanting to come to Canada, but it hasn't been a problem up until this point. So I is this going to help? I don't know. It might help in the future, but this is not the reason we are where we are now. It's because of small mom and pop investors that have, you know, committed mortgage fraud and, you know, all these things to get into the housing market and to drive prices up. So again, uh, not a multi-billion dollar hedge fund problem right now. The financialization of the housing market has been a big problem. Hence why I've used those stock patterns previously on this channel and today to show where prices may be going and patterns that are created in financial asset classes similar to this. And of course, it's true, right? So anyway, that's it for this week. Please leave me your comments down below. And until next week, I'll see you then.